Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old-time religion setting forth his sovereignty and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious Word of Sovereign Grace. Here's this week's message. It's so good to be here today. The few short hours that we've been here have well, already been rich in blessing, singing last night, fellowship afterward, good, sweet, refreshing sleep, and then waking up in the midst of a delightful family this morning and just getting caught up in all that cheer and happiness on this meeting day. It's been wonderful. Got to do a little jogging on a marvelous Nebraska road. The gravel is uh, just like little peas under your on your feet, and it's just like a foot massage. I ran a couple miles towards the, I believe it was towards the river, I think it was, and I, I thought as I ran, I thought that song went down in the river to pray. Not down to the river, mind you, but down in the river. And that's about baptism, that's about going down in the water. And that's the good old way, studying the good old way. Uh, that's what we want to do. We want to study that good old way. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, but we want to give heed not to those seducing spirits we want to give heed to the good old way and we want to stay in that good path that was set out but you know this opposition is something that goes away back Paul wrote to Timothy now the spirit speaketh expressly when he wrote now he meant now he meant the time when he was writing it the spirit speaketh expressly but it applies to us as well that in the latter times and it's been the latter times ever since the latter day blessing was poured out on Pentecost and the prophecies of Joel were fulfilled so those latter days have been characterized by certain features among them being that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils now it behooves us to know what the original faith is what the primitive faith of the church is that we might adhere to it that we might not follow the seduction of those who depart from it. It is seductive, and the word seduction is deliberately used because it's, it's a kind of an attractive lure that draws people away into a way that is... Uh, well, when you think of the word seduction, you think of, the, of immorality. And very much uh, false doctrine, false teachings are bound up in immorality. False doctrine is brought in to cover the real desire of the heart, which is to walk in ways that are not pleasing to God. Scripture warns us that in the latter times, that is to say our times... Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. Now, the spirits are, this temptation is always going to be around. But the problem is, some are going to give heed to it. We have to watch, we have to guard against it, lest we give heed to it. Verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy. All right, what does this, this look like when, when this false doctrine presents itself? When it presented itself in the first century, and now when it presents itself in the 21st century, what does it look like? What shape and form does it have? How shall we recognize it? It tells here, speaking lies in hypocrisy. Okay, these false teachers are speaking lies in hypocrisy. It's one thing to speak lies. Now, I can stand here and I can tell you two and two equals five. And anybody in the room, I hope, will be able to tell me that that is a lie. That's a simple lie. I can speak a lie in hypocrisy. And I can say, by fasting and abstaining from meats, you will grow closer to God. And you will have spiritual experiences that will put you in the third heaven. And I can tell you, I've, I've done that and I've gotten there that way. That's a lie. Not only is it a lie, it's a lie in hypocrisy. The hypocrisy of it is that I'm presuming to teach you something that didn't even work for me. False teachers do that, speaking lies in hypocrisy. The only way you can do that is having your conscience seared with a hot iron, because you don't, you don't really care. You don't really fundamentally believe in God, and you don't care if you're offending Him. You don't care if you're putting on a pretense. So the lies are spoken in hypocrisy, the conscience being seared with a hot iron. Here's some of the content of this doctrine, then as now. Forbidding to marry. These experts who come in with their twisted doctrines to deflect you off the path of timely salvation. What are the features that they'll bring in? Forbidding to marry. I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm driving towards three things. I'm, I'm going to let you know so that you'll see them coming. I find three things here that we have in common with the first century, and that is... It tells about forbidding marriage. We'll, we'll call that, we'll call that um, 
uh, marriage and then uh, abstaining from meat, we call that diet. And then a little later on it says bodily exercise profits, a little we call that uh, exercise. So we've got sex, diet, and exercise. That was the obsession of the first century. I believe that is the obsession of the 21st century as well. Uh, forbidding to marry. The idea that, okay, these, these false teachers, had, they had two ideas about marriage. Um, some of them thought you couldn't possibly be good. You couldn't possibly fulfill the law of God on this earth. So therefore, forget about it and just live as you like. And trust that there's an eternal spirit in you that's going to make it on to glory. Um, that, that, that's a seductive but false doctrine. Uh, the other view is that we can attain this perfection. And that we need to do it by various works of the flesh or, or works of effort. Uh, we apply ourselves by fasting, by diligent prayer, by works of what's called asceticism. Uh, self-denial. And this is all covered in forbidding to marry. You know, there are great institutions on this earth today that call themselves by the name of churches. And this is what they present, forbidding to marry. As if you're going to get closer to God and to the kingdom of heaven by, uh, by taking these vows and these obligations upon yourself. All it does is it messes up human life. Um, in my earliest childhood, I was taught by an order of Roman Catholic nuns. Dear, sweet young ladies who love little children. Where they got themselves into an institution where they're forbidden to marry and where all their normal influent, uh, impulses were turned in, in various different directions and uh, serving what? Not the children, not the Lord, but serving an institution which stands in the place of Christ, claiming that it is Christ, but it is not. And this is Antichrist, the false teaching, forbidding to marry. Uh, but it doesn't stop there with that kind of institutionalization. You look today in the New Age culture that's all around us, the New Age cult and culture that's all around us, and you'll find they too have all their methods and techniques of rousing the basic energies of, of the, the, the body onto what they think is going to take them into, into spirituality. They think they will perfect themselves by, by these, these practices of meditation, spiritual discipline. Uh, that brings us to the second point, second feature here, commanding to abstain from meats. Well, it is important that we eat the right things and not poison ourselves with, with too much sugar and other things are not bad, that are not good for us. But this is a, a, along a different order. This says that what you eat and what you drink is going to affect the kind of a being that you are. And if you eat spiritual food, you're going to turn into a spiritual being. This is an old Greek heresy. It's a very modern error today, too. You turn on the television any time of the day or night, you'll see inf infomercials tell you how to be a better person by changing what you eat. It's going to make you happy and healthy and give you peace of mind and heart and put you in love and charity with your neighbors. <laughs> salvation by diet. <laughs> All right. We talked about salvation by sex or by abstaining therefrom, and now we talk about salvation by diet. Uh, what's the matter with this? Well, the, the problem, with, problem with this with, with tinkering with, with, with our marital life or forbidding it and with tinkering with our, with our diet for, for spiritual reasons, fasting from, from vegetables like Hindu yogis and all this stuff. The problem with it is we've become wiser than the Lord. We've taken matters into our own hands and we are taking control of our spiritual lives and we're going to make ourselves, we're going to be self-made spiritual people. We're going to make ourselves into our own vision of, of what a spiritual person should be. This is in opposition to what God lays out for us which is for us to be simple as little children, as little lambs in his arms. God hath created these things to be received with thanksgiving of them that believe and know the truth. Yeah, God gave you meat and vegetables and good things to eat. Eat them with common sense and eat them in a balanced fashion. Give thanks to God for them. Uh, that, that's, that's a simple hearted, maybe it's a simple minded approach, I don't know. But we just come to the Lord as little children and, and we live that way before him. Uh, yes, as was mentioned, we do turn into lions at times when the provocation and the circumstances arise. We can turn into lions. But before the Lord and with each other, we are as little children. We are as little lambs. It says in, in God's expression to Noah that, yeah, you can, you can eat meat now. He said that. Not only vegetables, you can eat meat. He said that to Noah. Do you believe what God said to Noah? Receive it with thanksgiving and eat and don't fuss about this stuff. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Sanctified means it is, it is declared to be acceptable. And so many times over in Scripture, God says, uh, well, there was the Old Testament order where you had to be careful about forbidden things and not, not get involved with that. But in New Testament times, God said it's all clean. Uh, use it with, with sense and with discretion. Don't offend yourself. Don't offend your brother. But it's, it's all... It's all clean. It is sanctified. God said so by the word of God. It is made holy. God said it's holy. Sanctified by the word of God. And you can acknowledge that by prayer. You pray over your food. I hope we do. It's very important to pray out loud. Um, the family altar. 
uh, and the table, and maybe it's the same place, I don't know, in your home, could be, uh, but pray out loud. Don't expect just to lead fathers by, by your example, but pray out loud and put words and put meaning and put content behind your behavior so your children, wife, know why you're doing what you're doing. Sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Paul says, if thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. I want to be a good minister. I trust all the ministers here do. And there are people here who are not ministers, but you're also serving the Lord. And I trust you all want to do it good. You want to be good servants of the Lord. Paul says, the brethren in remembrance of these things. Well, what things? The things that, that Paul emphasizes throughout this, this epistle to Timothy. Um, in chapter 1, these things, holding faith with a good conscience. Um, these things. Uh, Paul, in the very, very opening verses, grace, mercy, and peace. I besought thee that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith. When you become so, so expert on, on fine questions, we forget about the most important thing, which is to be faithful and simple little children with the Lord. We get caught up in that which ministers questions. Oh, the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart, and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Paul says, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ. And what that means is salvation by grace through faith. With no addition of works in any of those three categories that, that Paul mentioned, that we mentioned and applied to the first century and the 21st century, no addition whatsoever, no admixture of works whatsoever. The pure and holy gospel is grace. And Paul says, you put the brethren in mind, in mind of that, keep them in remembrance of that, and you'll be a good minister. You want to be a good servant of the Lord, a deacon, whether you're, whether, uh, your brother or sister in the church. Uh, you don't have to have had holy hands laid on you. <laughs> But if you want to serve the Lord, that's what minister means if you want to serve the Lord. Put the brethren in remembrance of these things. What have I to talk about in your presence except the grace of God to me? Not my works, not what I've done to, to gain it or earn it or what I intend to do to improve on it. But what He did for me out of His grace, His sovereign grace and His love for me. Nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. We live in an age of spiritual seeking, don't we? People are always looking for something. They want to, they want to grow. They want to, they want to gain spiritual knowledge. Some of this is good if it's in the right context. If it's biblically well informed and you have a heart's desire, it's well informed by Scripture. Lord, show, thy, thy hast said, seek my face. Thy face, O Lord, will I seek. It's a good thing. Uh, but drawn by Scripture and drawn by the teachings of Scripture. Words of faith and of good doctrine. Whereunto thou hast attained. You see, there does come an end of seeking. Hard as it may be for this modern age of pilgrims and seekers to understand, there does come an end of seeking. There does come a point at which you say, I have found that which I sought. I have found that, that field which contains the treasure. I have found the pearl of great price. Uh, I will sell all. I will I'll rise up and follow. <laughs> I'll go down in the water to pray and study on the good old way. There comes a time when you attain... When no more can you say, I don't know, I'm seeking, I want a fuller understanding. Well, you want a fuller understanding, you want to learn more. But there's a ground on which you stand. Let's not be so overly humble and so falsely modest that we express uncertainty as to what God has given us. He's given us grace abounding unto which thou hast attained, not by any effort of your own, but by faith and grace. Words of faith and good doctrine. Stand on that which God has solidly given us and don't be afraid to claim the territory that he's put under your feet. Amen. Hallelujah. He's been so good to us. And sufficient. We don't need to add to it and bring stuff in that doesn't belong. So we can beef it up and improve and amplify what we have. It doesn't need that, brethren and sisters. It doesn't need that. Uh, refuse profane and old wives' fables. The word profane is a very interesting one. And what it means is outside the threshold of the temple. The word F-A-N-E, fane, I think it means the threshold of the temple, and pro means on the other side of it. Profane means it's stuff that belongs on the outside of the temple. It's stuff that doesn't belong in the church. Uh, don't bring that stuff into the church, Paul says to 
to the servant, to Timothy. Don't bring that stuff. Refuse profane, that which belongs outside the church. Don't bring it in. Secular matters don't belong in the church. Uh, the church is not here to teach you and, and to provide you with a place to play basketball. Um, <laughs> there are other, other institutions that do that for you. Uh, refuse that which is profane. Uh, that which belongs outside the church, leave it there. And old wives' fables. This, this refers to um, oh, fairy tales. Stories that uh, grandmas tell their children. There's no particular harm in them. But they're, again, they don't belong in the church either. We don't need myths and fairy tales in the church, little illustrative stories that talk about stuff that has no biblical foundation. The Bible abounds in content and in illustrations. We do not need to bring in fairy tales, mythology from elsewhere, which is oh so popular nowadays, this mixing of religions, just like in the first century when you took Judaism, you took Christianity, you took paganism, you blended it all together and came up with something that the Lord found impalatable. Refuse that stuff. It doesn't belong in the church. And exercise thyself rather unto godliness. I hope I didn't bring exercise in there with, 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 with diet and sex just to have a three-point sermon. <laughs> it says exercise, bodily exercise profiteth little. I'm glad it doesn't say it doesn't profit at all. It does have its use. Uh, it's good to maintain a, a physical form that uh, is... Uh, serviceable for the purposes of the Lord. We should pay some attention to eating sensibly and making good use of the good things that the Lord has given us. It profits a little. Obviously, if we kill ourselves by eating, eating badly and, and uh, not taking care of ourselves, we're not going to be of much use to the Lord because we're not going to be on earth. <laughs> uh, we need to sustain and care for the physical body. So it profits a little. <laughs> it's not, it's, it, it's not going to secure you a place in the kingdom of heaven. It's not even going to secure you a place... Uh, it's not going to secure you a place in, e in the eternal heaven, and it's not even going to secure you a place in the church on earth. Your place in the church on earth does not depend on your success in fulfilling these spiritual disciplines pertaining to marriage and, and diet and sex and other various ways that people tell you you ought to live your life. That's not where it starts. Yes, there are ways you ought to live your life, but that's not what qualifies us to be here. What qualifies us to be here is faith in Jesus Christ, which we know by the grace that he has bestowed upon us. Godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. I find that whenever the Bible says that, and I think there are about five times, if I'm not mistaken, where it says that this is a faithful saying, it's always something that is self-evident, kind of like the axioms of geometry. It's self-evident, but you wouldn't have known it if somebody hadn't said so. <laughs> and that's what he says here. Um, yeah, you have to stay alive in order to serve the Lord on earth. <laughs> Bodily exercise profits a little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. Why does the Lord, I wonder why the Lord sustains me on this earth sometimes. And in my heart, the answer is as long as I try to preach his word and try to serve his people good food, um, he'll tolerate me. Uh, that's not exactly my life's creed, but the Lord has shown me that. Um, if bodily exercises profits at all, it, I, I think it profits in order that we might be f fit and thereby a little better able. But, you know, there are many in the Bible who serve the Lord in conditions of considerable disability. Uh, the Lord is able to raise up the weak things, the broken things, the cast down things of uh, this world and use them according to his purposes as well. So therefore, the apostle says, it profits a little. <laughs> but Paul's great exertion there is to that which profits a great deal. Therefore, we labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. That's a beautiful verse. We, we, the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. How can He be the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe? Well, He's the Savior of all men in the sense that He's the Savior of... Um, God so loved the world, whosoever believeth. He's the Savior of all men in the sense He's the Savior of the whole world. All of them that He has loved with an eternal love. He's the Savior of them, especially of those that believe. Well, who are the ones that believe? They're the ones that get in the church. They come to the church, they hear the gospel call, and they're gathered. So he's the savior of all the elect. 
But there's a special salvation that comes to those who believe and are gathered into the church of God on earth. These things command and teach. Paul takes us back again and again to those basics, those fundamentals. It doesn't need to be amplified and fluffed up and put on slick paper and made into a program, but these simple things command and teach. Verse 12, let no man despise thy youth. What a world of instruction there is in that verse. Let no man despise thy youth. Timothy was evidently a young man at this time. And I think of several levels of meaning in this phrase. First and foremost, I think the instruction is, don't let anybody put you down because you're young in age. Being young in age is not a disqualification from the ministry to which Timothy was called. Neither is being advanced in age or at any particular point in age. Um, I, I preached on this not long ago and, and uh, said, well, for another thing, it said, let no man despise thy youth. That means don't be silly and, and blame it on youthfulness. Don't, don't, don't be a silly person in the stand. And, and Elder Clyde Farmer was, was in the congregation at the time, and he said that applies to old preachers too. <laughs> and it does. It applies to all of us. Um, this is a, a serious matter. This is a, a matter of grave concern. Um, the proclamation of the gospel, of salvation, of grace and faith. Um, let no man despise thy youth. You're as able to proclaim it as, as anyone else, is what it means. But be thou an example of the believers. There again, a young preacher, maybe he may, may feel he's not much of an example because maybe he hasn't had that much life experience. It will come. And in the course of its coming, grace will come with it. So that you, you can be an example. Uh, what a calling to be, to be an example. Not only to go through the, the things that everybody goes through in life, but to be an example, called to be an example. And furnished with grace, it will make that possible if in faith we lay hold on that grace. Be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, in what you say, in the way you behave, in charity, that means in your loving deeds, in spirit, that means your temperament, um, in faith, and in purity. Paul says, do these things till I come. Till I come. Now, that doesn't mean you're going to stop once, once Paul comes. But there is a wealth of meaning in that phrase, Paul writing that phrase to Timothy. Till I come. In other words, he's giving to Timothy the authority to act in his name, in his behalf, with an apostolic ministry until the apostle himself comes. You see, now this is a distinctive feature of the apostolic age. It doesn't work that way anymore. That is one of the pages in Bible history that God turned when the last of the apostles left the scene. The ministries which were distinctively apostolic, they ceased. The church did not thereby lose out on anything. We are not bereft of any good thing. But till I come, well, until then, Timothy, evangelist, uh, man in place and, and under appointment, he acts in behalf of the apostles. Um, let, let's go on and see a little bit more of what Timothy was doing. <clears throat> now, give attendance to reading, to exhortation, and to doctrine. These are public functions. Not private reading and study, but this is the, the reading like Jesus read in the synagogue when he took up the scroll. Reading, reading the scriptures to the people. To exhortation, that is as... In, in Ezra, when they took the scroll and they gave them, they read the words and they gave the sense, gave the meaning of it. Um, to doctrine, that is to teaching, drawing out the doctrinal content of Scripture. Paul says in verse 14, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Neglect not. That means to, to pay attention to the gift that is in thee and, and, and work with. Stir it up, it says later on. Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee... Note these phrases, by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Now here's something else that's apostolic, I believe, and something distinctive. In our ordinations, we do not have charismatic prophets giving utterances from the other world about the candidate. We do have sincere prayers and the laying on of hands in ordinations. But where it says that by prophecy, Timothy had a certain gift, 
There's a difference between the by and the with, ordained with the laying on of hands, but the conveying of the gift was by prophecy. For a sample of how that might have looked, look at the 13th chapter of Acts. And there's something a little bit earlier in, I think, the 11th chapter along the same line. In the 13th chapter, you'll find in the beginning phrases, uh, expressions of the, of the uh, chapter, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord and fasted. Sorry, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. So this is the prophets giving an utterance and communicating very specific information that resulted in a laying on of hands for Saul and Barnabas. Previously, uh, a couple chapters maybe just a chapter back, these same prophets had indicated that there was going to be a famine in the land. Uh, chapter 11, I believe. In those days came prophets from Jerusalem unto... Uh, I'm in chapter 11, verse 28. Uh, 27, 28. Prophets from Jerusalem came unto Antioch, and there stood up one of them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there should be great dearth throughout the world, uh, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. And the disciples made various arrangements to deal with that. Now, this is another charismatic prophetic utterance. By charismatic, I mean it was a, a gift God gave right then and there on the spot, and it, it just bubbled up and flowed forth, and there it was. You had this utterance about a, a famine that's coming. Likewise, in this ordination situation in Acts 13, commissioning situation in Acts 13 with a laying on of hands. Uh, you had prophets giving forth very specific information. I believe this was operative in the case of Timothy also. He became an elder when the presbyters laid their hands, but a prophet by the word of prophecy. The instruction, therefore, is neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. Take out what is temporary there, that which was given by prophecy, perhaps the gift of an evangelist, um, and rank that among the apostolic gifts, and you are left then with what the church, the gospel church, is permanently furnished with, which is the office of elder. Prophecy. Um, it, it's, sometimes it's said we take up tithes if we had Levites to give them to. We'd ordain evangelists if we had prophets to say he has the gift. But I believe the pages of, of Scripture history turned when the last apostle passed from the scene. And we are left now with elders and deacons. We are, left, we are not bereft. We have all that the apostolic church had, but it functions in a settled, established way in the congregations of the gospel church through the ministry of those who are apt to teach and, and of those who help. And lest anybody think that I'm denigrating evangelism for even a moment, Paul later on says, do the work of an evangelist. And, uh, and I am pleading also that we would do that work because that work is part of the commission uh, of elders and indeed in another sense of all of us, to whom the Lord has given his grace and good tidings. Meditate on these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. If we ever had any doubt whether we ought to stand up in the stand and give any evidence that we've studied beforehand, <laughs> I think that verse should prompt us to do all the studying we can and to give evidence of it when we're up here. I hope God help us. Take heed to thyself, or meditate upon these things. As study, ponder, contemplate, meditate. Roll it over in your mind continuously. This is not something that comes and goes. You, you work on it all the time. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. Uh, should, should gospel ministry be a full-time calling? Absolutely. Does that mean I'm going to make the equivalent of 40 hours a week salary with it? Absolutely not. <laughs> this is a calling to the Lord's dear children. This is not, this is not a an employment opportunity we're talking about here. But it is full-time, nevertheless. It is full-time. It is a full-time occupation. 
and I can meditate on Scripture while I'm while I'm mowing and while I'm building and while I'm doing the other things I have to do uh, and making T-shirts and whatever it is. But give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. I've heard various comments and response to preaching on various occasions on which I've preached. The only one to which I've ever, I hope, anyway, if I can say this sincerely, given any heed, is one dear sister who said, Brother Steve, I believe I can see a little bit of, a little bit of progress in you. <laughs> and, you know, that's it. A little bit of progress. Just something that's just a little bit more helpful to the church. Uh, the, the, the meal, the feed of, of God's Word is presented in a little bit more palatable, a little bit more applicable form, that it can be assimilated and applied to the life a little bit better. Let your profiting appear unto all. And it's, it's a practical matter. It's got to be practical application. Let thy profiting appear to all. Take heed to thyself and unto the doctrine. This taking heed. I, I love that word, take heed. It does not imply to be a bully or a boss or an overseer. It doesn't mean you're to, 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 to ride roughshod on yourself and make yourself miserable by self-accusation constantly. Take heed unto thyself. Well, I tell you, as I travel among the Lord's people, I'm privileged to stay in various homes from time to time. And in, in many of these homes, I see the same way of life acted out no matter where we are, whether in Georgia or Alabama or whether in Nebraska or Missouri, wherever it is, Illinois, Indiana, wherever, uh, I keep at, the list gets longer. But I see the same thing. I see these wonderful households of happy people, sweet children, uh, mothers and fathers, um, living in love and charity with, with their sons and daughters. Um, words of peace, words of gentleness. Um, the fathers, they, they, they monitor the children, of course, to keep order in the household, but so gently. Uh, just that gentle supervision. The child knows he's not going to go straight because dad is watching. Uh, dad can carry, pretty well carry on a conversation with you if you're visiting in the home, but there's just that portion of his awareness that sits on each little child in that house, and, and he governs and guides and guards each one uh, by taking heed. We need to be that way with our own selves. Just let that gentle awareness cover all that we do and be aware take heed you're living in the presence of God take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine yeah there's a scriptural principle for every question that arises in life doesn't matter what it is there's a there's a, a bunch up in Canada trying to raise a child don't want to tell the child whether it's male or female I don't want to tell anybody else whether it is or not I don't know if you saw that in the news it was, uh, on NBC I saw it the other day <laughs> she had this child they're not going to tell anybody whether it's a boy or a girl a little baby what foolishness um, <laughs> But you know, there's a doctrinal point. There's a, there's a chapter and verse in the Bible for every problem that people cook up in this life. And there is chapter and verse that applies to that problem that those folks are creating for that unfortunate child. And it says, male and female created he them. And it was very good. That's chapter and verse answer to that question of whether you ought to raise a gender neutral child. What an idea. <laughs> Unto the doctrine, continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. If there's any doubt as to whether we need salvation in time, that last verse nails it down. Continue in, in dedicated application and faithful application of the principles of Scripture, and you will know what it is to be saved. Thyself and them that hear thee. Thank you for your very kind attention. Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.